Ruiz. bit about uh felipe win what was he like well felipe we we uh we was looking for a lead singer in our band you know it was, and uh felipe was gigging in a club downtown and uh we went downtown and talked to him about joining us and uh he agreed to join us and uh because we had we had seen the ohio players this is what happened uh, one night me and boosie and catfish went to this club in one of the hills Cincinnati. It was called Babes, and uh, we watched the Ohio players, and they had like horn players, and they were they was dressed in pretty burnt orange suits, and so we was impressed. And we never all we had was us three of us, you know. So we need a lead singer, so we can get more gigs. So we talked to Felipe. He was real nice. Yeah, he could sing. He he reminded me of Billy Stewart. You know, a guy named Billy Stewart. That's how Felipe reminded me of. And then uh, we had such a tight, tight thing going. That's why he wanted me to come and play with him with the spinners. Because I knew every, I knew everything he did. I knew, I, I followed him just like anything, you know. So that's why he wanted me to join the spinners with him because he knew I was going to be the drummer. For, and the spinners loved me. That's why I say I quit them twice, and they got and they hired me back. He had a you very, know? he had a very unique voice. I thought. Oh man, he could sing, yeah. he, and then he he could ad lib. I know one got him with George in there when 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 they did knee deep and uh, uh, all that. I know one got Felipe with. Well, really, I told Catfish. Felipe said, "Tiger man, can you can you can you tell Boosie and them I want to record? I need some, you know." So I told Cat. I said, "Cat, uh, Felipe want to uh, hook up." And see, can he do some recording? And Cat said, okay, let me call George. And George said, yeah. So that's how they hooked up. And and Felipe did um, that Uncle Jam thing with George, you know? And uh, and, then, and when he quit George and them, I went back and started playing with him again. When he quit the Spinners, I went and played with him too when he had his other group with him. And then uh, he didn't do, he had a record I called Starting Out Over. It didn't really do well. And people kept telling him he should have never left the spinners. You know? why, why did he leave the spinners? Do you know? They didn't like him. <laughs> really? They didn't. The spinners didn't like him. The spinners, majority of the spinners, all four of them, they all grew up together in Detroit, going to high school together. And they lead singer, he quit the group. LG, LG quit the group to go and be with uh, Big Gordy's sister. So spinners hired Felipe to be their lead singer, but they never liked him. They really never liked him because they, I don't know if they thought he had an attitude problem or what, but they didn't really, I used to hang with Billy, the little short fat guy in the spinners, Billy Henderson. I, now that's who I hung with all the time. And I used to hang, I, they got me a house over in, uh, I stayed at Marvin Gaye house on Appaline Drive for a year. And then I moved from there and stayed at the Holiday Inn on 8 Mile and Myers for a year and a half. I lived at the Holiday Inn in for a year and a half when I was playing with them, you know. Did you did you do any uh, studio stuff or just uh, the tour? No, I just did. I just uh, it was just four of us. Uh, we was uh, uh, he had they got the organ player and a bass player from Indianapolis, a dude named Turk and a dude named Ronnie Boyhead, and they got the guitar player that used to play with Marvin Gaye named Joel Jackson. If you look on Marvin Gaye album, you see this guy with this big afro playing guitar. He was the guitar player with the Spinners. And uh, and I was a drummer, so we only had four four members in the band, and uh, I was the only one from Detroit. You know, I mean, I was the only one from Cincinnati that lived in Detroit. 
because the rest of them was from Indianapolis and Cleveland, Ohio, you know. But you're on some of the records or only on the... I'm all, I did all the live stuff. If you look on TV and see all the live stuff with the spinners on live on okay. TV, uh-huh. I did most of that stuff. I'm on drums playing all that stuff with them. Okay. Like I said, I did Marvin, I did uh, Mike Douglas, Merv Griffith, Midnight Special, I did Midnight Special a whole lot of times. I think we did Midnight Session about five or six times. And uh, James Earl Jones, that's what I was thinking of. We did James Earl Jones' TV show because he had a TV show out in L.A. And we did his TV show. So you we must, did that there for a while. You must have gotten to meet a lot of interesting and famous people doing those TV shows. Oh, I met, uh, see, I met a lot of people. I met, I met, uh Jose Fiasiana, the guitar player, the blind one. Yeah. I met um, uh, Bill Winters. I, be, I met, uh, uh, used to sing uh, with uh, Lou Ross and them. Uh, uh, and he was married to uh, uh, a cook. Uh, what's his name? The dad, uh, the same, uh, Sam Cook. He was married to Sam Cook's wife. Uh, it's a guitar player name. Uh, I can't think of his name now. But I met him, and uh, I met a lot of people. I met uh, everybody at King Records. We we recorded behind Bill Doggett, uh, Honky Tonk Popcorn. We did that for Bill Doggett. Uh, we recorded I Want to Go Where the Soul Trees Grow. But, you know, we recorded a lot of stuff at King Records, man. We, I mean, uh, like I said, the stuff we recorded behind Charles Sperling, he had a whole bunch of artists that we recorded behind. Uh, we recorded behind the last album that Hank Ballard ever recorded. We recorded that. Uh, Marvel Whitney, uh, Bobby Bird, we recorded uh, his records. He didn't record no album. He, all he recorded was 45 records. What was he like um, to hang out Bobby with? Bobby Bird? Yeah. You know, it's funny. Let me tell you this story. See, Bobby Bird helped James Brown when he was in jail and blah, blah, blah. Got them together, and, you know, and he got him with the, they needed a lead singer with the Flames. And Bobby Bird got him the job with the Flames. And uh, James, some kind of way, after he recorded Please, 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 he uh, told the people to put the record out as James Brown and the Flame. So when they put the record out, it was selling so much that the Flames complained because they wouldn't, it shouldn't have been James Brown and the Flames, it just should have been James, the Flames. But James Brown put his name on top of it, and they couldn't read. And, and how nearly, not how nearly, but uh, the dude that owned King at the time, he didn't want to pull the record back off the record, so he left it like that. So next thing, James was in charge of the group thing, you know, because it was James. Everybody wanted to see James Brown and the Flames. So eventually, James Brown got rid of the Flames. Only flame he kept was Bobby Bird. He got rid of everybody else, and he kept Bobby Bird. Bobby Bird was nice. He was real cool. But see, him and Bobby Bird fell out because Bobby Bird married Vicki Anderson. James Brown was in love with Vicki Anderson before Bobby Bird married her. So when he, when when Bobby Bird married Vicki Anderson, James got rid of Bobby Bird and Vicki Anderson, and he hired Hank Ballard and Marvel Whitney. Mm-hmm. And then when he got married at Hank Ballard and Marvel Whitney, got Bobby Bird and Vic Anderson back in the group. <laughs> it was weird, you know. You know, cats with the cats who got money and power, man, they, they you know, they take advantage of everybody always. It never changed. Yeah, it's it's a shame because, you know, a lot of times it's the managers, but then when the actual band leaders and musicians do it too, man. It's sad. I mean, yeah, it's really sad, cause especially when you grow up with cats, you know, you and you and you grow with cats and you and you, and you, I mean, I, I have been with them longer. I've been with my wife 30 some years, but when you think about it, I've been with them longer than I've been with my wife, you know? And for them to be like that, to, to be a certain way, it's sort of crazy to me. You know, like I said, Boosie used to say that he wouldn't even mention my name. He would always say the, the drummer, the drummer. He would never say my name, you know? You- but then he put my name on all his records. Do you, Which do, you, is cool. do you know what tracks on the on the sweat band? Do you know what tracks you played on? Or oh, I'm not on none of that. I ain't on none of that. You're not, I'm, I'm just I'm just I was just a tour drummer. 
when it when with Mazio with Mazio and and uh, you see it was Butch Butch Small, Mazio Parker, uh, Larry Hatchett, uh, Kevin Oliver, Mike Mitchell, uh, David Chong, Razor Johnson, and me. That was a sweatband band. And uh, when we went on tour with Boosie and them, it was the greatest funk tour on earth. And we was we was kicking their butts. We was kicking their butts so bad, they stopped us from being the opening act on the show. They told us that we didn't have a, enough time for us to play no more. So the rest of the tour, we didn't play. We played behind Boosie. Was was Zap on that tour? Were they out yet? Yeah. yeah. Uh, Slide, Slide, Slide was on the show. Uh, Roger Trotman was on the show. Uh, George Clinton and Boosie and Sweatband. And yeah. God Mama was singing behind us. And uh, God Mama was singing in the background with us. I had a live recording of it for a while. I don't know what I did with it, but I, I had a lot. We was kicking. We was kicking butt. It seems was, like it seems like you you've you've done a lot more um, live performance than studio work. Uh, how come it's worked out that way? Well, I played behind uh, I, I played behind Aretha Sister, Irma Franklin, you know. And I played behind. I told you I played behind Law Lee. I'm more. Of a, I, I guess I was more of a tour drummer, but I was a studio drummer too because I recorded a lot of stuff at King Record. Right. I didn't record. Uh, I, you know, I recorded some stuff with Boosie and Neil. And I recorded the, when we was the house guests. I recorded records with uh, my man Set Me Free and all that kind of stuff with Boosie and Neil. But they took credit. For the records, they put their name on the record as writers, so I didn't care. You know, I wouldn't get paid for all that job. I was just wondering if maybe if I was just wondering if maybe you preferred playing on stage with with a crowd. You know, oh, I yeah, I enjoy playing music. I'm a musician. You know what I'm saying? I enjoy playing in nightclubs. I mean, I grew up playing in nightclubs. I mean, I mean, it was a pleasure to play at arenas and cost. You know, it was, I mean, all that kind of stuff is nice. I mean, for real. But the bottom line is that I'm a musician. I just enjoy playing. You know, I, I'm not trying to. I'm not trying to impress nobody, really. That's why I didn't complain when people was taking credit. And I, I, I got mad a couple of times and said that's some bullshit, you know. But other side of that, I, you know, I enjoy playing. I, I'm a musician. That's the first thing, and almost the first and only thing. I'm a musician. I like playing music. I don't care about all that other stuff. You know, I'm not trying to. I'm not trying to impress nobody but myself. How, how much, uh, if any, interaction did you have with George Clinton? You know, me and George. I didn't really like George when we first met him in Detroit. And then when I, and like I told you, when I messed up on the session in Detroit, and I was in the studio with him, he was always like, "Well, what's wrong, Tiger? What's wrong, man? How you? Why are you? Why are you feeling like that? And, you know." And I really didn't want to talk to him about that. I didn't, I didn't really like George. I didn't think we needed George. When uh, Malia came and got us to hook up with George and be part of the Funkadelics and stuff like that, I didn't think we needed George. We was already we was already uh, uh, we was already making money without George, and we was already a popular band traveling without him. We didn't need him or anything. We made him sound better. See, he had one record out. I want to testify, and they was dressed up in suits and like like the Temptations or Four Tops, mm -hmm. and, and you know I'm like, I'm like we don't need him. We was doing our own thing, and but Boosie and him clicked, and George told Boosie whatever, and, and that would happen. You know, like I said, once Cat was out the picture, and Boosie and George was like this. Cause we weren't like that with George, you know. We didn't hang out with George like that, you know. I, I like to me, I didn't ever. Just between me and you, I didn't really like George that much, you know. I thought he was arrogant. I really did think he was arrogant, but you know, him and Boosie, they hit, they clicked, they clicked, and Boosie, and he got Boosie to deal with Warner Brothers Records and whoever else he got him with. So that's how that worked with them, you know. And then Boosie hired other cats. He didn't hire the same cast that was in the house guest band. Right. He hired different cast to be in the rubber band, you know? And only two cats that was in the band was him and, and Catfish. Frank wasn't in that band, you know? And uh, so 
That was it. They did end up selling a lot of records, though. Yeah, yeah, they sold records, you know. But think about it. Well, listen, to, look at all the other musicians that played with them. They ain't got nothing to show for it. That's the sad truth, that. yeah. And they recorded, they recorded them same records with them. They played on the same show with them. I mean, Razor, listen, Razor recorded all kind of songs with Boosie. He left from Baltimore, Maryland to live in Cincinnati to play with Boosie. Boosie dialed Razor out. Razor lived in a one-bedroom apartment. No money, no car, nothing. And all them records he recorded with Boosie. Boosie didn't come to his aid. When, when Frank needed something, when, when uh, Razor needed something, Boosie told him to get on welfare. Hmm. Get food stamps. I'm just telling you the truth, man. I ain't, you know, I ain't got nothing to lie about, you know. And like I said, I ain't trying to impress nobody. You know? Were you, were you tight? Me. Were you tight with Razor? Oh, me and Razor was cool. He was my brother-in-law. I hooked him up with my sister. He had two kids going on my sister. Oh wow. Yeah, me and Razor were real cool for your dad, man. Like I said, me and Mudbone. I I call Mudbone right now if you want me to talk to Mudbone. Me and Mud, me and Mud like this. You know, he don't mess with Boosie. You know, he is a unsung hero, big time, Mudbone. Yeah, he really is, man. Because he, he, like I said, he wrote "I'd Rather Be With You." He should have been rich off that one song, and then he went bigger than George or Boosie when he had Sly Fox. He was bigger than Boosie was when he was with Sly Fox. He had his own thing. He didn't need Boosie. Great you know, singer. Boosie yeah. Huh? Great singer. Yeah, I mean, but think about this. This is what I want you to think about. Them guys, they make all the money. And you play behind them and you need something. And they don't come to your aid. What is that? You know? And and, and, and all the guys I know that play with George, they all dead just about. And they ain't got nothing to show for it. All the guys that play with Boosie, they ain't got nothing to show for it. And his last band he had, them young boys, they left their jobs and their wives and everything to play with Boosie. And when they came back, they didn't have no jobs, no wife, nothing. So what do you show for that? When cats, when you get give you all that kind of stuff, where is the loyalty when they should give it back to you when you gave it to them? Yeah. George mm -hmm. got a big ass place in Tallahassee, big old country place, farm and everything. But he's the only one. Well, one, nobody else. one of the most vocal people about that was uh, Bernie's wife. Yeah, it's the truth. Bernie died because he didn't have no money. He had to play nightclub gigs to bring him money. George didn't give him nothing. And when George and Sly got the million dollars, they didn't get nobody no money. They didn't get nobody nothing. George bought a big old place down here in Tallahassee. He living comfortably. Boosie bought a big old 33-acre farm up in Cincinnati. You live in comfortable. But ain't nobody else. Think about all the other guys. Is that most everybody else did. Yeah, Think we, about it. We lost a lot of them the past 10 years. Yeah, A lot of them did, and they ain't got nothing to show for it. Nothing. Mm -hmm. The only one got something to show for it is Boosie and George. Because they didn't share it with nobody else. So did you uh, meet a... Uh, interact with George Clinton at all after that, later on? Uh, George didn't like me. I didn't like him either. <laughs> I, I, I told him that. I don't like George. I didn't like George. You know, and I told I told him one day, I said, you know what? Y'all get rich off of cats like us. That's why y'all rich, because of guys like us. So ever since then, we ain't never been cool. Yeah. And one day I talked I, I talked to his, this one day I called his studio down in Tallahassee. And he told the people to hang up on me. Wow. Man, that's what I said. <laughs> hey, baby. What's that? Oh, y'all killed him? How y'all get him? Call that mother away. Okay, thank you, baby. Yeah, but you know, like I said, I was always upset with them because I felt like they should always share. Everybody should get a piece of the pie. You know, I always felt like everybody should get a piece of the pie. And they never felt like that, you know? So what what did you do uh, after the spinners? Well, after the spinners, I came back home and I started playing with a band called uh, Westbound. 
Then I stopped playing with them, and I stopped playing with another band called E Funk. And then I, before E Funk, I played with this old man called H. Bond Ferguson and the Medicine Man. He did a, he played blues. I went, I went everywhere with him. You know, uh, I went to Switzerland. Uh, I went up in uh, Poconos. Went all Oklahoma and stuff like that. I played a lot of blues gigs with him, and we played up in Chicago a lot too. You know, and uh, I can I sometimes think of the guitar player that owned two clubs of Chicago, Buddy Guy. Oh yeah. Buddy Guy wanted me to play drums for him when he seen me playing behind uh Ace Bomb, but I didn't play with Buddy Guy. I didn't I didn't take that gig. And uh I came back home at the I after I got to playing with uh, Ace Bomb, I started playing with another band called E Funk, a local band called E Funk. And uh, we did a lot of weddings and played a lot of casinos and stuff, you know. And then my wife, mother got sick and uh, she wanted us to move down here in uh, Thomasville, Georgia, just before she passed. So we've been down here about 15, 16 years, you know. But you know what, it was funny, you know, I used to always have uh, hard feelings about Boosie because he owed me a lot of money, right? And one night, God came to me, and I'm just to being honest with you, God came to me and said, Tiger, why are you sick? Why are you stuck on this one page? He said, there are many pages in your life to get on with your life. So why don't you get on with your life and get off this page you on? And when I woke up that morning, that thought was still in my head. Why Why am I stuck on this page? Why am I mad at this man because he owed me money because he ain't going to pay me? So <laughs> so why am I holding these grudges on my chest like hot coals? Let me get over this. So once I got over that... I didn't care about nothing no more. I used to get mad when I used to hear Jabbo and Clyde and them talking about tracks they recorded with Jay. And I'm like, hey, this is a biatch. These motherfuckers are taking credit for stuff I did, you know? But then again, I said, well, damn, he, Jay never paid me to record them songs. So why am I upset? You know? So I ain't got nothing to be upset about. So I just said, forget it, man. You know, I know what I done done. You know? I know how good I am. You know? So I don't need nobody to tell me how good or how bad I am. One day, Boosie told me, oh, Bob, you ain't got it no more. I said, what? Oh, you ain't got it. Because he didn't want, because I didn't want to play for him. He was going to try to kill my whole ego thing. Oh, you ain't, you ain't got it no more, Bob. You used to have it. Now, this last record I recorded, this one right here, he said, the beat that can't be denied. Listen to the record. He talking about me. Now, how is it I'm the beat that can't be denied, and I ain't got it no more? So, yeah. are, are you on that whole thing or just some tracks? I recorded the whole album by myself. I played, I played, I played the whole track on this one. I'm, the, I'm the drummer on all that. There's some good stuff I on there. I recorded a lot of stuff with Boosie, man. Listen, I recorded a whole bunch of stuff. Boosie didn't give me credit. Like I said, his first album, Stretching Out, I played a lot of tracks on that. But you know, he took my name off of it, so he didn't want to pay me. You know who name I told you? He put Casper, the Friendly Ghost, and everybody like, who is Casper? Did nobody know who Casper Friendly Ghost was? And then all of a sudden he put a sheet on with a Casper outline on a sheet when he played on stage, trying to make everybody think he was Casper. But Bootsy has played some. I think I think he played drums on Flashlight. At least they say he did. Yeah, yeah because he learned how to play drums watching me. <laughs> he didn't. He didn't learn how to play drums watching Frank Waddy. I've been with Frank. I've been with Bootsy ever since he started playing with us, me and Catfish. From the first time we started the band together, it was just me, him, and Catfish. He had no, anyway, that's it. And we was the rhythm section from, for a long, that's why our rhythm section was so tight. Cause we had been playing together for so long. We rehearsed every day. We rehearsed six, seven hours a day, every day, just the three of us. And then when we did hire some horn players, we still rehearsed it like that. And, and that's why we were so tight. We were one of the baddest bands in Cincinnati at the time. You know, with this uh, recently, I mean, last year they came out with that uh, unreleased JB's recording and also uh, this uh, one that I held up before. Um, yeah, do you think there's uh, other stuff from back then that you recorded that still hasn't been released? Yeah, it's a whole, man, I got, I'm going to show you this. Look, I got a catalog. I had a friend give me this. I don't know if you can see it. But I got a catalog. Let me 
Okay, that's a catalog of yeah. all clean recording. I got pages and pages of recording from clean records that don't nobody have. The reason why I got them is because I recorded a lot of Vicky Anderson. I recorded this, 1969, James Brown, uh, Let a Man Come In and Do the Popcorn. I recorded all that stuff. Uh, uh, Carol Barkley came down from the mountain. It's country thing. Uh, Bo Dollar, the drummer, I want to go where the Soul Trees drove. He used the same tracks that we did behind Arthur Prysock, and he recorded the vocals on it. I got stuff to listen. Uh, Popcorn Charlie, Charles Sperling, Buddy Boy, Charles Sperling, uh, Marvel Whitney, I made a mistake because it's only you, only you, Marvel Whitney, 69. Those are things that have been released, right? Yeah. yeah. Soul Power. Now, it's a whole lot of stuff on here that, like I said, James had a whole lot of stuff in his, uh, mm -hmm. and, you know, he had a lot of stuff at King Records that he never did release. He recorded records every week. When, when King Records gave him his own label, and he had that orange and black label with his picture on it, the 45 records. Yeah. He would record every week, man. This cat would be in the studio every week and we releasing records every month. He would release records every month. And that was because we were recording stuff like that. He never had a band like us. Major and them wasn't like us. Major and them was a good blues, jack. You know, they were that kind of band. But they wasn't no funk band. We was the only funk band he ever had. And to this day, he still ain't got no funk band. When he was still living, he never had a funk band. He mm. was the only funk band James ever had. And he always played the stuff real fast with the new cats. We always had it in the pocket. We all, When we played with James, everything was always in the pocket with him. He could, he could sing, dance. And every night, they had to stick needles in his knees to drain the liquids out of his knees. Mm. I'm going to tell you this. Ain't nobody going to tell you this. Miss Gert was our wardrobe mistress, the skirt, right? And just before the band played, she would come and give us old peas, these little pink orange peels, old peas. They were like speed and give us a, a Coke or orange pop or something to drink. And we would take them peels just before we start playing. And when we played, we played so fast that when we came off the of stage, we would sweat so much, you thought we had stepped in a puddle of water. Our, feet, our shoes would be so wet, my sweat running down into the shoes. That's how hot and sweaty we were playing. And he would give us uniform that didn't make no sense. He would give us jumpsuits that were made out of, they're like, like this sweater. You know, and you playing down in there for all that hot light. We <laughs> would be sweating like dogs, man. Especially on drums, right? Uh, and drummers don't never get a break. Horn players get a break. Guitar players get a break. Piano players get a break, but drummers always playing all day, all night. You don't never get a break. I mean, I'm going to tell you this story. Let me right. tell you this one story. So we was driving from either Florida to go to, from Florida. We was either coming from Texas going to Florida. That's what it was. We was coming from Texas going to Florida. So we get to this first hotel we were supposed to stay at. Uh, they cancel our reservation. So we had to found another hotel to stay in. So once we got to the hotel where we were going to stay in, we everybody ran and took the clothes off and jumped in the swimming pool in their drawers and, and we drinking wine and hollering and screaming, you know. I pulled my arm out of the socket, this, my left arm, because I couldn't swim. I didn't know how to swim, but I was stupid enough to jump in the water. And, and, I, was, and, and I was trying to come out the water, my arm popped. And I was like trying to do a dog swim with one arm, and I kept falling in the water. So Phelps was laughing, and so Hassan seen me drowning, and Hassan pulled me out the water, took me back to the room, and they took me back to the room, and Hassan put his feet on my neck and my shoulder, my ribs, and tried to pull my arm back, and, and it wouldn't go back. And I'm like, oh God! So we went to the front desk and told the guy that I fell in the tub. So the guy was scared. So he gave us his car and told us where the, the hospital was. So uh, we go to the hospital, 
They shoot me in my butt with some stuff. I wake up. I'm on a table. They got weights on my arm. The doctor come and put my arm back in and, and, you know, put it back in. And my arm is in a sling. So we walk him down the walkway to the hotel and all these palm trees and stuff like on the walkway. And so all of a sudden, Mr. Bobbitt and James come from behind a palm tree and they're walking towards us. And I got a, I got a sling on now, right? So I holler and Mr. And James said, hey, how you doing, Tiger? You feeling all right? I'm like, yes, Mr. Yeah, Mr. Brown. I'm, I'm, I'm doing fine. I'm all right. He said, you going to be able to make the gig tonight? I said, yes, sir. I'm going to be able to make the gig. He said, all right, all right. So it's like 4 or 5 o'clock in the morning, right? And we walking past him. He walking past us. He tell Mr. Bobby, if he miss a beat, send his ass home. So that night, now usually Jabbo play, I play, but that one night, he had me play the whole show by myself. My arm was killing me. My 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 finger right here was so bad that Miss Gert had to give me some alpine liquid stuff to put in some water to soak my hand. And I sit on the toilet and and had my hand in the sink all night. Wow. That's how I crazy. I'm telling you, man. I, Tiger, you know. Why do you think that there's been so much misinformation out there over the years, you know, in terms of credits and things like that? Uh, you know, I really believe that most people are hateful and evil, you know, because what other reason, what other reason would you not give a person credit for what they did? It wasn't some evil behind it. You know, or uh, something hateful. You know, and uh, and and why would you tell stories that's not the truth, and tell half stories? You know, or try to take credit for somebody else's work. It's, it's evil to me. You know, because you ain't paying them no money to tell the truth. You know, you ain't taking nothing away from them to tell the truth. So for you not to tell the truth about stuff. It just completely evil. So you think ma malice was involved, basically? Yeah, exactly. You know, because I mean, I, yeah, I never did nothing to him personally. Huh? Only thing I did to him personally was say that I'm not gonna work for you. One day I, would, you know, this. Let me say this: I had went to hair school. I went to uh, Mola Beauty College for a whole year to learn how to do hair because I thought, well, if I learn how to do hair and I go on the road. I can make extra money. You know, people had curls and haircuts. I said, yeah, let me do that. So I was doing Booksy hair at my house. And me and my wife, me and my wife was uh, in the house when I was doing his hair. And this was when he started up the second rubber band. So I was doing his hair and he said, yeah, Bob, uh, listen, I want you to play uh, for the, uh, the rubber band and, and, uh, and I'm going to pay you $350 a night. And I'm, I'm doing this hair, and I'm thinking, wow, this cat didn't even ask me how much I wanted or would I play. You know, so I said, uh, well, Boosie, you know what I'm thinking, man? I said, baby, I call because I call him baby. I said, well, baby, listen, man, uh, I think I should get at least $500 a night, and I'll predict and I'll predict, you know? He said, you know what, Bob? That ain't in my budget. I said, well, if it ain't in your budget, you must don't want me to play. So he got mad, got up, got his hair done, and he lived, he lived about 30, 30 miles away from us, didn't he? He lived about 30 miles from us. So and then, so me and my wife went to the grocery store, and I came back. There was an envelope in the mailbox. I'm like, the mail done already ran. Who is this? It's a boost. It's a letter from Boost telling me that he can't mess with me and Razor no more. He was mad at me and Razor. I don't know why he was mad at Razor, but he put Razor name in my letter. Like he he was mad at me and Razor, and I was and I was no longer his boy. You you used to be my boy, Bob, but you ain't my boy no more. What is this? I said, this nigga crazy, man. And he drove from his house back to my house and put the letter in my mailbox. That's how crazy he is. I'm like, wow, man. He he tells he tells that story he's told many times about uh, tripping on acid with the JBs while you guys were on stage 
Do you do you remember that's that, or were were you that's doing drugs lie. too? That's a lie. That's a all that stuff he be talking about. That's a lie. He want people to think that he like Jimi Hendrix. He used to go to bed at night time listening to Jimi Hendrix. He wanted to be a Jimmy a Jimi Hendrix on bass. That's it. Pussy be lying. I'm telling you, man, this cat lied. He had us come to his house last year to do a video take. And this lady was doing an interview with us. And they was asking us, when did you meet Fels and, and Booksy? And how did their life affect your life? And I'm like, wow. Okay, we're taping this and, you know, we record it. And I, and I was telling this guy named Sugar, uh, Big Big Rob, that worked with uh, Roger and them. I was telling him, I said, so he said, uh, you know what, Tyga? He said, man. Only reason Boosie got us recording this stuff and telling us, telling when we met them and how we met them, and not is because he can't remember. He been telling lies for so long, he don't even remember the truth no more. And that's the truth. He he, he lied about everything. He he told a story one day. This is the truth. He said that James Brown opened the back door of King Records and he was standing out there in the parking lot, and James said, "Hey, Boosie." I heard about you, man. Come on in here. That was the biggest lie I've heard in my life. Because like I said, he never gave Charles, he, he, we, in, in his interviews, he never gave this cat named Charles Sperling. And look him up. I'm telling you now, look him up when you, you get through doing this. Look up Charles Sperling. Boosie never gave him credit, but let him get, be in King's studio. Boosie acted like he did it all his own. Boosie had like he was he was in charge of the band. Why would he be in charge of the band? And he the youngest cat in the band. Who would let him be the band leader? Who? Mm -hmm. That don't make no sense. And people believe that stuff that he be saying. Because he Boosie and he a superstar. So when the superstar tell you stuff, it's the truth. It's supposed to be, ain't it? He be lying. And I tell that in front of his face. He lie all the time. Wow. Uh, tell, you, tell, you, tell your followers that Boosie be a liar. And, <laughs> well, they're going to hear it from you. Yeah. Is he can? And you can say that Tiger said that Boosie be a liar, so you don't be in trouble. Uh, just say Tiger said Boosie be a liar and see what he's do. He ain't going to do nothing because he know I'm telling the truth. What do you what do you think about uh, funk music itself is so special and why has it captivated so many people for so long? Because it's, it's for real. It's from it's from within, you know? It's something that you feel, you know? It ain't, it ain't something that you write down on a piece of paper and, and everybody can't play funk, you know? Everybody can't play it, you know? It's something that, that comes from within, you know? And then when you were with a lot of cats together, it's like a, a marriage or a relationship, you know, a family. And once the family jails together, it's something that can nobody cut through it. So that's how, that's how I look at it. Funk, funk music is another generation, you know, it, and it's going to always be here. I mean, you know, music, on, funk music, music in general is a universal language. Everybody understands music. I don't care what language you speak. Or what country you live in, everybody understand music. I don't you know. That's the common sense. And funk music is the next step from where we was coming. We're growing. I mean, we came from country and western to blues and soul and 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 then rap music, you know. And then it's taken to another level or something else. It's gonna always be something. But funk music gonna always come back to the to the pages where people gonna have to play. Cause it's, it's it's natural, it's common, it's it's easy to play, it really is, and it's and and it's, and it's easy to the ear. When you hear a beat, a bag beat, and somebody play another thing to it, and, and next thing you know, you patting your feet to it. It's like a, a hoop nanny, you know how people used to do back in the old days, get on the porch with harmonica and beat on pans and and sing and and just have a good time. That's all it is, a good time. And everybody enjoying itself. That's what punk music is. Yeah, sounds good to me. What uh, What are you most proud of 
when you look back on your career? I'm blessed, you know. God blessed me to learn how to play drums and be able to travel. When I was a little boy, my grandma used to bring home these National Geographic magazines. And I just looked through. I couldn't read that good. I just read good at the pictures and be happy looking at the pictures and seeing different countries. And then when I had the opportunity to go to places playing music, you know, it didn't get no better than that. And I started out playing music. All I did, when I first started playing drums, oh, I just wanted somebody to say, come on, take it, come on, jam with us, man. And I was happy just to jam, you know. But then once I start playing and start getting paid to do that, and I'm like, wow, you gonna pay me to play drums? Whoa. I was happy as a sissy in Boys Town, really, really, you know. I'm like, wow, man, this is this is fantastic. And then travel the country, especially when you just travel to the United States, places you ain't never been in the United States before. And then you get a chance to go outside the country. I'll be called some music, you know. Hey, you don't get no better than that. You really don't. That's why I said I ain't, you know, I don't hold no hot, no, no hot, whole crap. Coals on my chest no more. Uh, I'm past that stage, you know. I'm 70 years old, you know. And when I when I was 19, 20, and all that, I was wild, having fun, enjoying myself, and I didn't even know what I was doing. I was just doing it. It was just natural, you know. And we used to make a lot of mistakes on James Brown records, and he kept them. I mean, for real, you can hear a lot of mistakes on them to die. There's got to be the way you the guys band stopped it. Huh? The way you guys recorded them, there's got to be some mistakes, yeah. Oh, there was a lot of mistakes, and they kept a lot of mistakes, you know. Uh, but that was part of the deal, you know. We we learned from our mistakes, and we made them better. James Brown, he loved us, you know. He really did. He, I mean, like I said, we were the best band he ever had, man. You know, we really was. What, what what advice would you give to young musicians coming up now, maybe, to avoid some of the, you know, hardships that you went through? Really stay true to yourself. You know, I think most people being backwards to be in a certain position and you're not happy in that position, you know, and you, and you should always stay true to yourself, you know. If you're going to be a musician, be a musician. You know, don't let nobody change that. You know, I was talking to my brother the other day. He played in a church band. And the lead, the, the guy that played the lead, his timing is so bad that they all, everybody in the band complained, but they don't want to tell him because he's in charge, you know. And my brother said, man, I don't know what to do, man, because when I'm playing piano, his tempo is up and down. I said, well, you know what? My advice to you is to be true to yourself. If you're a true musician, you play. You don't worry about nobody else playing. You enjoy doing do what you do. Don't worry about what Tom and Tom and Dick is doing. Don't worry about that. Do what you do. And then if you're true to yourself, everything will fall in place. You know? But if you ain't true to yourself, don't nothing work out for you. Because you 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 faking it. And like they say, if you fake the funk, your nose will grow. Yeah. It's Pinocchio theory you know? right there. Oh, yeah. It's the truth. It really is the truth. And you can see the people that be faking the funk. Some people be playing and they be quiet and you be like, where they at? And, you know, faking the funk. <laughs> some people can play. Some people. I moved down here in Georgia, right? Thomasville, Georgia. And this cat's down here got certificates on their walls for going to school for music. I mean, colleges and stuff. But they cannot play. They don't have no good timing. They don't, they don't even know what time it is, I don't think. I, I'm like looking at them like, wow, you got you got certificates on the wall and you don't know how to play? And you teaching music? I don't understand it, you know? I taught myself, and I, and, I, and I outplayed a lot of musicians that was playing years before I was, just because I was true to myself, you know? But if you're a young musician and you're trying to make it in this world, you know, record companies ain't like they used to be. No. That's how I got to tell you. They ain't what they used to be. I got record companies right now owe me money. Polydor Records, Atlantic Records. I got companies owe me money. And every time I would try to get in touch with them, they changed the company to a different name. Mm. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So, I mean, 
mainly just be true to yourself. I mean, you know, it, it, if you're true to yourself, it's going to fall in place regardless. You know, whatever's going to happen is going to happen if you, if, if you do it or if you don't do it. So I just, my thing is just practice every day, practice to get better at what you're doing and enjoy it. If you don't enjoy doing it, it ain't worth doing it. But if you got to enjoy doing it for it to work, and if you're enjoying it, and it's going to fall in place. Watch me. Believe that. Because, you know, I didn't have no manager. I didn't have nobody watching my back doing everything. I, I just trusted in God, and everything just fell in place for me, you know? Yeah. Is there any other um, messaging you'd like to get out to funk fans or, you know, JB well, let me or just, fans? Let me or... say this to everybody, man. You can't believe everything everybody tells you. You can't believe everything you read. So some things ain't true, you know? And people tell lies to make themselves look good, you know? And that's sad. If, to me, that's really sad. You know, like I said earlier, we should all be able to enjoy a slice of the pie, you know? Mm -hmm. I mean, you might be able to get a half of it, but there's still another half that other people should be able to enjoy. But sometimes when people get money and get power, they don't want to share nothing with nobody. And I done seen cats to help other cats make money and die penniless. No money, nothing. Nothing to leave their kids, their family, and nothing, man. And that's sad. Very sad. You know? That's yeah. sad. That's really, it's really sad, man, when you think it like that, man. And you're working for these people, and they got millions of dollars, and they don't want to share none of that with you? You know? That's sad. To me, it is. I don't know about nobody else. So, I, you know, like I said, God helped me to get over that nonsense, you know, and I, I'm, I'm so glad I ain't in that no more, you know, because sometimes it can be evil, you know, it can be evil, and yeah, unless you can handle that, stay at home, you know, that's what I tell you, stay at home, man, because you can get turned out on the road. I'm glad you came out of that tunnel, Tiger, and I'm glad you're here to tell these stories, and this show is called Truth and Rhythm for a reason to get the truth from, you know, folks like you that have lived it. Well, I'm glad you let me tell the truth because I'm 70 years old, man, and I've been trying to tell the truth for a long time when well, nobody listened to me. I told people what I recorded for James Brown. They said I didn't record it. I'm like, man, I did record that stuff, man. Huh? I'm telling you, I recorded that stuff. But, then, you know, they said somebody else recorded it. I'm like, okay, you know, what can I say? I ain't going to fight you about it, but I know what I did. So I'm just glad that you took the time to listen to what I had to say. A pleasure. Thank you for uh, coming on and sharing all that. Hey, back at Truth and Rhythm headquarters. Thank you for joining us on another magical ride with Truth and Rhythm. Whether you're watching or listening, as always, thank you so much for your continued interest and support. Be sure to subscribe. Go to YouTube. Go to the Funk and Stuff channel. That's where Truth and Rhythm lives and breathes and thrives. Also, goodies here like TIR Quick Takes. And if you subscribe, you know what? You get the show before anyone else. It's free. If you love jazz, funk, R&B, soul, you can't miss it. Pass it along. Tell a friend. Tell family. This audience is growing, and it is a beautiful thing. All coming together for the love of this great music. Also, if you can throw us a buck or two, we could use the support financially, keeping the lights on, keeping the servers going, all these expenses. If you can help support the program, whatever you can give, much appreciated. Go to the funkinstuff.net website. And on the right-hand side of every page, you just click and you can donate through PayPal, credit card, whatever. Very easy to do and so much appreciated. And if you do a sizable donation, I will mention you on the program. Also drop me a line, email me at scottg at funkinstuff.net. Let me know who else you'd like to see on the show, what you enjoy about the music. Let's just kibitz and uh, talk about stuff, you know, talk music. You'll find that I respond very quickly and I much enjoy the uh, rapport and the camaraderie and the interaction. Always remember, this is your show, The True Music Lover. So for now, that's all the time we have for this one. It's a wrap. As always, Scott Dr. G.X. Goldfine saying, 
keep on vibrating to the rhythm of the one. we